Hello and welcome to another edition of Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, Mailbag is a feature of the channel where you guys leave lots of comments on the channel and I attempt to answer those comments or if I can't answer those comments, I throw it out to you guys who have more knowledge on some of this stuff than I do. So, let's get into the first mailbag of this session. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. Next comment or question comes from the Death Beat, and uh, this was in response to No Boutique JX10 uh, SY85. Where did I buy that drive? A video I did in March 2022. And Gary writes, I didn't realize the JX10 was simply two JX8s. Uh, very interesting. I'm wondering if Roland chose to brand the boutique module the JX8 because it's th that's considered to be a more desirable machine by retro synth fans. Um, it possibly is. I think they might have also learned their lesson from the initial um, ARIA products. For example, everyone was really excited to be able to have a modern 303, 808 and 909. But once the dust settled, Roland realised that the people really wanted was new machines that looked identical to the original. Also in regards to the PG-8X, which is a free VST replica of the JX-8P that we talked about recently. I have used one on my forthcoming tunes and I can confirm that it's really a really really nice synth. Um, the only thing about it is that it didn't I didn't like much was the fact that you have to load each preset individually as a file which becomes very very tedious but in terms of render quality it holds its ground against all of the modern synths such as the Massive X and Pigments. Cheers! I mean, this is this is really interesting because you know, going back to this, the the JX10 architecture was effectively two JX8Ps, and therefore those that love the JX8P would be a natural progression. The JX10 also provided a large keyboard and buttons that were not membrane based, which was really important. You know, membrane based keyboards are horrible, and they they did tend to break. Um, I too found it strange that Boutique is stranded after the JX8 uh, is branded after the JX8P, which is effectively got the functionality of the JX10 or Super JX. Although I might suspect it related to the fact that JX8P was far better known than JX10. Um, and I, I sort of expand on that because on my wish list, I've got a JX10, a Super JX is on my wish list to buy. I've had a, I've borrowed uh, Richard's uh, JX8P uh, and as you can see behind me at the moment, I've actually got Gary's, this is Gary obviously commenting, but this is Gary's um, JX3P, which is in for service. Um, I'm just testing it at the moment. Uh, but for me, if I was going to buy one of these, I would buy the JX10 because the JX10 not only has is a better keyboard in my view, being the 76 keys, but also it's more supported in the forums and user groups. Anyway, um, and and the fact that. Gary talks about the PGA-X in the past. I have to admit, I've downloaded the VST. I've got to agree, it's a good rendition for the JX-8P. But it's just not hardware, is it? <laughs> Shouldn't do that, I cough. Next video, or video, next comment or question comes from XP50 Player. Uh, and it's in response to it's 40 years since Only You, a video I did in uh, April 2022. Um, <clears throat> and uh, XP50 player, I thought, I've, I thought the keyboard players themselves covered their synth bands, uh, brands as not to give away the endorsement value for free. Um, Euro Electronica was like this, was uh, not played much at the time. In my part of the US, it, but it was introduced to me by friends in the early college years. By that time, I was really into MIDI sequencing and grew to love all of Vince Clark's affiliated acts, Pet Shop Boys and the Human League. The problem with the US is, is in terms of music, it tends to be very compartmentalised. 
Um, I found that in my, my various stints in the US. Um, this this may well have been the case for a few musicians. They they some of them did cover up the the fact that they had Yammer, but if they were being promoted um, by the the synth company to use their synths, then the reality was they probably wanted them uncovered. Um, that was how how the synth company got its sort of promotional value effectively by seeing the 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 artist play the synth, and then obviously aspiring artists would want that synthesizer. Um, so they needed it. They weren't really wanted to display prominently. Now, a friend of mine who was a studio manager back in the late 70s and into the early 80s um, said that the party line at the BBC was they should not commercially endorse anyone. Um, a line of neutrality was to be stood, was to be taken. And therefore, on top of the pops, where anything, everything got on stage pretty much had a name on it, the guys with the gaffer tape had a field day. So basically what they would do is just come along and put gaffer tape along the... The back where the where the name of the synth was so you couldn't see it um so it wasn't promoting a brand um and i know that was the case because that was the bbc all over um but then back in those days nobody actually paid that played their instruments on top of the box anyway the songs were performed to a backing track um that was recorded a few days earlier with the bbc symphonic orchestra um pop classic you might say <laughs> um this was another one of the bbc's rules that the uh that had every, all, all, all live music had to be played by an orchestra. Um, I understand there was uproars when bands were allowed to play their own music on, and the uh, BBC orchestra was fired. Because it was, if you go back and look at Top of the Pops in the day, and uh, sorry um, my, to people who don't live in, potentially in Europe, but definitely in the UK, um, you know, Top of the Pops was the sort of the de facto um, music show it used to happen every week and it used to go down the charts the top 40 or top 30 as it was in there when it went to the top 40 um, in the UK and um, nobody on the on there ever played their instruments live not up until quite late on sort of in the 90s I think it was when they started playing instruments live because after time when they got on stage they were all pickled they'd all been in what they used to call the green room which was a sort of hospitality suite they always to get themselves completely blast, blasted on the free bows, and then they used to go on stage and bounce around like lunatics. There's no way they could play instruments. <laughs> oh dear. Um, anyway, you know, it, as I say, it all changed and things started probably because the you know, the guys with the poles up their asses um, were basically either fired or retired off, and that was the problem with the BBC. It was run by a bunch of civil servants. Um, which is why a lot of um, popular drama ended up getting made by independent um, television, not the BBC, because they had a slightly wider remit. Hey ho!